As educators, you know we all make a difference in the lives of our students, and for many, that difference lasts a lifetime. Even when we don't realize it, there are moments that we share with our kids, our memories that they will hold on to and continue to share with their colleagues, families, and friends. Our president is no different. Please turn to the screens as we hear some very special people in President Andrew Sparr's life, his former students. What comes to mind most with Mr. Sparr was his enthusiasm and his wittiness. I remember sometimes we would read stories and one of my favorites that he would read was Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. He was so animated. Classical music, and my newfound love for classical music. Anything Disney, just, I, mean, I can still remember it. Put it up here, chin up, grab it, and then, yeah, just, <sighs> being in class made me feel like I was at a, at an orchestra, just, just being astonished. Like, man, being a little kid, you never seen anybody play a violin, like, in person. And it's just, just going at it, just ever so lightly. And I'm like, man, please teach me more. <laughs> the trips, the field trips, I didn't, I think he used to work for Friendly's. And we used to go to Friendly's after a show and eat free ice cream. So I remember those, <laughs> those good times. And Mr. Spar, he always allowed me to express like my feelings towards being having to move around and jump around from place to place. Um, and really having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with him, like I said, really opened my mind up to see world, the world a lot different than I was before. For me being a girl and like this black girl learning the violin and getting so interested in it and then I was so intrigued to be a part of the orchestra because of that and I wouldn't have thought about this prior to him. He allowed me to use his violin and if anybody knows Mr. Spar's violin was like legit, right? He had to open up the case, it had the velvet um, and it was one that he allowed me to play because I was first chair. Um, in the orchestra and just being so like humble. I know I was a kid, I'm pretty sure he could have been like thinking so many things, but he was very um, just caring, honing in on a skill, introducing me to things that probably wouldn't have been something that I would have known about prior to. So I will take that with me always. If I had to describe Mr. Spar in one word, that word would be amazing. Remarkable. Caring. Genuine. Engaging. He's a very humble person. I would say amazing. Phenomenal, that's how I would describe him. The families would come out, it was somewhat of a evening activity and he did a performance, it was 70s theme, so the teachers and staff on campus got together, the parents and kids came out, and there was food and music, but he performed, <laughs> probably he's gonna wonder why should I told this story, but play that funky music white boy. <laughs> and he had on the costume, and he did a whole performance. I remember I was playing um, Mariah, and he kept telling me, he was like, you have to have more attitude, more. <laughs> so he was like, you have to be no, no, no. And then he did, he, did, he acted out the whole thing, it was funny. And I remember when his wife, Miss um, Barr, came to teach at Tier T Small, and he was really crushing on her quite hard. And as kids, we all had like this inside joke that one day they would be married. And that was like in 1995, 96, and they really, you know, did come to be, but he used to be so like quirky with her and it was just so cute and fun. And as a small child to see that, like he was sending little notes. And we were always wondering like, why are we, why are we always going to Miss Williams' classroom from Mr. Spar and you know, stuff like that. But those little moments were real, they were funny to us. And I think that you've done so much for students that you don't even recognize how important
important you are to some people um, by being humble, by being humorous, by being caring, and just being yourself. You've done such a great job, and I'm so proud of you. Thank you for being a great teacher. Um, thank you for being a great role model um, as a man specifically. Um, you are the best, and I think you know that. And it was great because you not only had me, you had my sister, you had my cousins. I'm glad that I got the chance to experience uh, working with you as a student and seeing you outside in my adulthood. So thank you. Um, I think that he's a beautiful soul, um, that he is a pioneer and a life changer um, in so many different ways. I wish he was still teaching, so that way my kids can experience that same thing like I experienced when I was a kid. So if you're watching, when I have kids, I need you to teach them how to play the violin. Cool. <laughs> Good evening, delegates. Wow. That was an amazing video. I hadn't seen it till just now. And I want to thank, excuse me. <laughs> I want to thank the FEA comms team and my favorite delegate, my wife, Vernell who helped pull that together. You know, we all make such a difference every day and you sometimes don't realize it so much uh, until you get to see your kids, and that's what we call them, our kids, out and about and all grown up. And seeing that video was just overwhelming. I spent nine years in the classroom at Turry T. Small Elementary School in Daytona Beach. And I'm gonna tell you in that nine years, I learned more from those kids than I ever taught them. There's not a doubt in my mind. So before I begin my formal remarks, I wanna take a moment and recognize the talented and dedicated Vice President of the Florida Education Association, Ms. Carol Garonskis. and the incredible and passionate Secretary Treasurer of the Florida Education Association, Ms. Nandi Riley. You may not know this, but having a teacher, an education staff professional, a higher ed professor in the three highest office in any state union is rare and extremely powerful. I haven't yet found another instance where this has happened before. This past year has been an enormously difficult and trying time for our union, for our leaders, which includes all of you here, for our students and for Florida's public schools. This past year has tested our resolve. It has challenged our thinking, our vision, and our focus. It has challenged us. It has tested us. And although we've made mistakes along the way, it has indeed strengthened us. When the governor signed Senate Bill 256, by all accounts, the worst piece of anti-public education, anti-worker legislation we had ever seen, he and his allies were confident that they were signing our death warrant. They believed this bill would finally eliminate the only consistent and powerful defender of public education in the state of Florida, the Florida Education Association. Yet, and yet, 
a little over five months after he signed that bill, FEA memberships stands at nearly 115,000 dues-paying members. Now, we still have yet to convert over 25,000 members to the new system of collection dues collection. But after what we've been able to accomplish in such a short time and against all predictions, we will get there. And I believe it will be by January 9th, the first day of the 2024 legislative session. Two years ago at this DA, we spoke about not throwing away our shot. Last year, we discussed how in our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded goal. This year, let's talk about, as the song says, we ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. I wanna spend some time connecting the dots as to what and who is relentlessly trying to turn us around. All dots lead us back to a coordinated effort started over two decades ago, financed by certain billionaires with the goal of destroying public education. The first dot. About 25 years ago, lawmakers in Florida, at the behest of certain billionaires, started on a path to undermine public education. In the late 1990s, the first voucher and charter school bills were passed by the Florida legislature. At that time, about 90% of Florida students attended public schools, and those who saw public school tax dollars as the last cash cow in the state's budget wanted to funnel public education dollars to private purses. Yet even though those bills were passed, parents continued to overwhelmingly send their children to public schools. They couldn't turn us around. And year after year since, they have tried to incentivize parents to leave the public schools behind, take a voucher, and send their kids to corporate-run, for-profit, and unaccountable private schools operated by their friends. But because of the incredible work of you and our colleagues around this state, parents continue to see public schools as the best place to educate their children. After a decade of failing to get parents to take the bait, they decided to try another approach. Go after those who work in our schools. The second dot. About 13 years ago, they took away job protections and changed how teachers and staff were paid, including doing away with steps or at least making them irrelevant. They tied salary to student test scores and made it harder for us to do our job. Again, they continued down this path year after year, producing a massive teacher and staff shortage and hoping this would drive parents to vouchers and charters. We continued to defend public education, and our members continued to achieve more with less. And once again, they failed. They could not turn us around. And so, here we are, another decade down the road. And still, 90% of Florida students attend public schools. So their current plan is to throw everything they can at public schools, and now colleges and universities too, by attacking curriculum, curriculum, vilifying teachers, staff, and professors, and rolling out universal vouchers for corporate-run private schools and homeschooling too. Dot number three. The, the attack on curriculum is very deliberate, and it's focused on fear. A fear they manufactured so that some parents might believe we do horrible and despicable things to their kids during the school day. I want to say something right here, right now, that I hope does not offend anyone in this room. But we must be honest about what some of the elite power brokers in this country are trying to do. They are living up to, or down to, the saying attributed to Joseph Goebbels. Quote, 
If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it, end quote. When they started this whole critical race theory business, they hoped their lies would get some parents to fear that teachers were somehow teaching their kids to feel bad about being white. When they focused on stop, stop woke, they hoped that some parents would believe their lie that teachers are telling kids to take to the street and instigate violence. When they spoke about parental rights, they hoped that some parents would believe their lie that we were indoctrinating their kindergarten into being gay. To get parents to buy these lies, they used political ideologists, some so-called moms, people who often had no connection, no connection to our public schools to make wild accusations against individual teachers and staff, knowing the sensational accusations would make headlines and drive their political narrative. They went after books, pulling one sentence or two paragraphs out of a book to declare proof that it backed up their atrocious lies. They did not care about the context, the intended message, or what the author was conveying. They did not care if kids saw themselves in those books or were excited about reading. They didn't care that their political views meant taking away the rights of other parents, if not most parents, who wanted their kids to have access and to and read those books. This gang of elites wanted to build their narrative and drive parents out of public schools. You know, Florida leads the nation in the number of books pulled off shelves in our public schools, more than double any other state and more than the next four states combined. The books banned in Florida represent 40% of books banned in the United States of America. On a side note, in many districts in Florida, parents are required to give permission for their students to go to the media center. To date, well less than one half of 1% have said they don't want their child to have access to the media center, demonstrating that parents are not concerned with the books in our schools. Weaponizing curriculum through lies is designed to get parents to distrust us and our public schools. And while some may think it's being used to get parents with concerns to take a voucher, it's not. It's designed to get parents who want their kids to have access to all sorts of books, who want their kids to learn an honest and complete history, who want their kids to have access to advanced placement courses, and who want their kids to be in culturally diverse and comprehensively academic schools to consider, consider vouchers, because none of these laws or attacks are aimed at private schools. But as I mentioned earlier, so far, it hasn't worked. This year, out of over 3 million public school students, only about 16,000 have left for vouchers, meaning still 90% of Florida students attend public schools. We continue to defend our public schools and we continue to push back against the lies. And we will not let nobody turn us around. As you know, not only has this attack on curriculum been aimed at vilifying us and our colleagues, the lack of, the lack of clarity around what we can and cannot teach has led to mass confusion and a lot more work. Workloads, and class size I might add, are at an all-time high, while our pay continues to stagnate. What happens to our public schools and universities if too many great teachers and staff finally say, I'm out? leave their keys on the desk and head for the door. Dot number four. How many of you are satisfied with your pay? 
Yeah. How many of you feel you are paid fairly? How many of you have vacancies in your work site right now? Wow. Wow. Over the past few years, laws have been passed that have created such an unfair system of pay. Our rights to freely negotiate have been curtailed, and we have all suffered because of it. I did some research recently. In 2010, starting pay in one county was about $34,000 a year, and top pay, someone with 25 years of experience, was making just over 60. This means that a teacher with 25 or more years was making nearly twice what a teacher starting out was being paid. Today, beginning teacher pay in that county is just under 49,000, while a teacher with more than 25 years of experience is making about 58,000. Not only is that about $2,000 less than a top paid teacher was making 13 years ago in real dollars, but it's also only $9,000 more than a beginning teacher, nowhere close to double. Had experienced teacher pay increased at the same rate as new teacher pay, that teacher would have been earning over $86,000 a year today, but they're not. All due to legislation that curtails our ability to bargain. State laws have literally robbed that teacher and a bunch of others of nearly $30,000 a year. This is not unique as it is happening in almost every county in this state, especially when you don't count for the referendum funding we passed. But it is intentional and it is not okay. The final dot to connect involves the attack on our right to have a powerful and effective union. The billionaires that have pushed vouchers for 25 years, undercut our pay for 13 years, have been attacking the curriculum and creating chaos over the past three years, are the same people who want to take away your freedom and your right to come together in a union. Article one, section six, of the Florida Constitution states, quote, the right of persons to work shall not be denied or abridged on account of, a, of membership, or not membership, in any, any labor union or labor organization. The right of employees by and through a labor organization to bargain collectively shall not be denied or abridged, end quote. Our right to a union and our right to bargain through that union is in the Florida Constitution. And yet today, our rights to bargain have been significantly abridged. Even our right to have a union has been significantly abridged. This is all being done by the people who want to terminate public education. Follow me now. They have been trying to extinguish Florida's public schools, but they have kept running into a massive defense system. You, the educators of the state of Florida, who have come together in their local union and their state union, the Florida Education Association. So these billionaires, only recourse is to go after your rights, to join your union, and to even have a union. And they have made it clear, they will stop at nothing to get it done. They will threaten, they will bully, they will lie, they will deceive, and they will divide in order to break us. But we will not let nobody turn us around. They have been coming after public schools for decades, and we have stood in their way. Even in the face of tyranny, we have made some amazing progress. 
We have stood by one another and seen improvements in the teacher certification process. We have stood up and secured a $15 an hour minimum wage for education staff professionals. We have stood strong and are seeing some of the largest pay raises in years in places like Lee County, Nassau County, Osceola County, Hillsborough County, and many other counties, colleges, and universities around the state. We've shown that by having a strong and mighty union, we can defend our public schools and we can fight for better pay, better working conditions, and better education for every child. The moment of truth is now. Where will you stand? Those powerful words were spoken by the FEA Executive Director, Phil Constance, in 1968, days before the great Florida teacher walkout. I want to quote Mr. Constance and for all of us here to recreate a moment back in 1968 by asking you to close your eyes. Close your eyes right now. Keep them closed. Now you are alone. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. You will be at that moment of truth. You will be alone. And you will not know whether the others will stand. You will only know what you have decided. Your profession is at a moment of truth. You are at a moment of truth. If you will stand with your profession, come what may, stand up. Stand up now. Get on your feet and get out of that chair. Stand tall. You are an educator. Now open your eyes. Look, they're standing all around. Keep standing. As educators, we are never alone. We stand on the shoulders of the giants who came before us, and we are the foundation of those who will come after us. I know these are scary times, and even standing here, you are likely still concerned about what is happening to our professions and to our schools, colleges, and universities. Some of you may look at what is happening and say, nothing can be done. Some may say, I can't do anything about it. But as we stand here right now, feel the power in this room. We are not alone. We are together. We will save these professions one step at a time. So, so if you believe we deserve better and fairer pay, lock arms with the person to your right. If you believe we must have the freedom to use our professional expertise to do our jobs, lock arms with the person to your left. Here we are, locked arm in arm. The most powerful way to stand for our moment of truth. What a visual. You know, when we hold hands, Someone can easily break through and pull us apart. But when we stand locked arm in arm, it's extremely difficult to break our bond, to turn us around, to deny us our freedoms and our rights. We are locked arm in arm to support each other, to continue to defend our profession, our students' rights, and our public schools. We must remain locked arm in arm as we do the work here at the DA and when we return home. Arm in arm with our colleagues throughout our union so that the evil doers cannot tear us apart, cannot turn us around, and cannot dismantle the most important professions in the world. We are the FEA, and this is our moment of truth. Thank you.